What is the purpose of God in commanding us to fast? There's a happiness, there's a calmness, there's a tranquility, there's a sense of fulfilling our purpose that we find when we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we don't find anywhere else. How far can we go in and extrapolate in rational benefits from these activities? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a slave driver. It's a chore to pray. It's a chore to fast. It's a chore to go on hajj. Sometimes we experience it once and we savor it and we search for it again. In the rational world in which we live, people will question, why do we need to submit to a creator? This idea of human rights, it arose in the Christian West in response to irrational religion. Imam al-Ghazali, he said that revelation is a light and the mind is an eye. We are in the month of Ramadan where Muslims the world over share in a simple yet profound act of fasting from dawn to dusk. Our collective commitment to this activity is often met with surprise by others who do not share our faith. How can someone be so devoted to a creator and why is sacrifice so important to submission? We in the West are often confronted with questions about fasting and Islamic practice in general and some have found the standard answers insufficient in answering the questioner. In a so-called rational West where everything has to be justified, many Muslims want to know why. Why do we fast? Why do we pray and why do we have to follow a sharia? To help us navigate the topic of rationality in Islam and how that interacts with the sharia, I'm honoured to have on the show Sheikh Hamza Karmali. Sheikh Hamza has studied and mastered the Islamic sciences and Arabic grammar and rhetoric. His institute, Basira Education, aims at addressing some of the thoughts that undermine confidence in Islam and help a younger generation observe their religion with rational certainty. He has a course currently running, Why Islam is True, more information about this, and to become a patron to support our show is available in the show notes. Sheikh Hamza Karmali, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to The Thinking Muslim. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Pleasure to be here. Well, it's wonderful to have you with us, uh, Sheikh Hamza. Now, Sheikh Hamza, I started by discussing the whole idea of rationality and how it interacts with Islam. And I know you do a lot of work with Muslims, especially those Muslims who have doubts about Islam. And so yeah. this is a subject that is very close to you and, and to your dawah activities. Yes. Uh, let me start by the obvious question that we're all asked at some point in our lives, probably every year. Fasting is a devotion. It's an act of ibadat. Uh, but can we say there are other reasons behind fasting? When we answer questions about why we fast, are we allowed to say uh, because we want to show empathy with those who are starving, for example, or with the poor? Uh, can we uh, develop our own rationality uh, regarding why we fast? So Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, there was a drought in the Muslim lands. While there was a drought, he did not eat meat because he, as the ruler of the Muslims, he felt that he, it was not right for him to eat a full meal while the other Muslims are starving. So. Today, as we're fasting in this blessed month of Ramadan, and we watch what's happening in the news, and we see children scraping the bottoms of the pot, of pots and pans to try and find something to eat, um, we feel something as we fast. And this is normal, and it's natural, and it's part of an optimal adherence to the Sharia of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, because Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala emphasizes brotherhood, and we and that that feeling it comes out as we're fasting. But when we talk about the purpose of fasting, the question that we're asking is that when God commanded us to fast, is there a purpose? What is the purpose? What is the purpose of God in commanding us to fast? That purpose, in the, we discern from the texts, and that purpose isn't to show empathy. The purpose of fasting is to restrict our desires out of an act of devotion to God in order to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what comes through in the text. So there's no other text which indicates a different purpose apart from that 
basic relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to as an act of devotion to him yeah I mean the nature the nature of fasting actually the nature of all of the ibadat the nature of all of the ibadat is to show our submission to God yeah now as we as we um, uh, live in a world where people are not used to submitting to God or submitting to anything um, in this context there's certain wisdoms that we find. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, He says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ yeah. The purpose for which I created human beings and jinn, the only purpose is لِيَعْبُدُونَ So scholars, they explain that the lamb here, they call it lamb al-aqiba. And so it's, which means that, that human beings, they have been created with the purpose of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. So when somebody has a bat, you know, a cricket bat, so that cricket bat, its purpose is to hit a cricket ball. If I take a pen and I try to hit a cricket ball with the pen, it's not going to work because that's not the purpose for which the pen has been made. The purpose for which the human beings have been made is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's a happiness, there's a calmness, there's a tranquility, there's a sense of fulfilling our purpose that we find when we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we don't find anywhere else. Okay, that's interesting. So uh, you did say that we do show a level of empathy or we can argue that there is an empathy that can be built into our minds when we uh, think about uh, fasting and the poor in the world. So how far can we go when we look at the ibadat, when we look at the series of whether it's fasting or prayer or whatever it may be, how far can we go in and extrapolating benefits, I suppose, human uh, rational benefits from these activities in order to explain to ourselves and explain to others why these activities are, are worthwhile? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a slave driver. Hmm. We show ubudiyah to him, but... He is Ar-Rahman, He is Ar-Rahim, He is Latifun Bi-Ibadihi, He is gentle to His servants. Yeah. So when we obey Him, then we find all kinds of goodness and happiness and benefit. Yeah. And sometimes it's unexpected. It's unexpected from our perspective. But in the grand scheme of things, everything that comes to us is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we obey Him, we find goodness. And yeah. so... When I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I find any kind of a benefit that comes from it, that is a benefit. Because Allah created me, He created my worship, and He created the benefit. Now, the issue that comes is that, that when, let's say, that I am worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I don't find a particular benefit, mm. does that mean that I shouldn't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that invalidate the command? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands me to do something, mm. then his commands are not arbitrary. When we look at the Sharia, we look at the Quran, we look at the Sunnah, we find again and again that his commands and prohibitions, they have purposes. So he tells us not to steal. Obviously, you know, what's the benefit of that? It's We're not harming another human being. Yeah. Preservation of, of wealth. He tells us, to be kind to other people, to give charity. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't command us to do things that are immoral and harmful. And we find that empirically as we observe His commands. So when I see this and I look at, the, at, at, at His particular commands, I can discern in particular instances that it's clear that the purpose of this command or prohibition is the attainment of this particular benefit for me. So uh, in certain cases, when I, when I see these benefits, I can also discern that it is a purpose in such a way that the, when, when the purpose is there, the command is there. When the purpose is not there, the command is not there. We call this a'illa, mm -hmm. which is the, the legal cause for the ruling. Um, so uh, for example, in, when we're fasting, um, if I am traveling, then traveling is an illa. It's a legal cause for being permitted not to fast. If I get sick, then sickness is a legal cause 
that permits me not to fast. And this legal cause, it has a benefit. It's a clear benefit that I am not harming myself. So I can discern benefits in the commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 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 given to me. Mm. So and these and these these benefits, these purposes, when they're not there, then the command is not there. When they are there, then the command is there. So this is a different kind of purpose and benefit yeah. than the general benefits that we get from obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I've understood you, there are rational benefits we can derive from activities that we do on a daily basis, whether that's fasting or prayer or going to Hajj or whatever it may be, or going to the mosque and pray, and we can say it's, it creates a communal atmosphere. Yeah. So there is a rational benefit there, uh, but, that, but that rational benefit does not in any way impede the activity of doing the action. So if, for example, you didn't find that benefit, you can't stop doing the action. If you couldn't find tranquility or some form of rational benefit in yeah. prayer, you're not allowed to stop doing that action. But how does that differ to what you've just said at the end there, when you talked about the illa, the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in an action, in an action, in an activity, how does that rational benefit differ to the divine illa? So I don't, I don't understand. Like, for, 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 oh, well, so is is the dif- is the divine illa? Uh, is that something that we we derive, or is that something Allah places within the within the Quran? Yes. Yeah. So so the we work out what the illa is from the statements of the Quran and Sunnah yeah. and Ijma and Qiyas. Yes. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He says, for example, that He. F- in the Quran, he's forbidden gambling and wine. And then he says that shaitan, he wants to He wants to place enmity and disagreement amongst you. Mm-hmm. So when somebody gambles, then there is a... When, when, when somebody gambles and they put down their money and you throw it, you know, at the roll of a dice, you lose all of this money, yeah. then you feel it's not fair. Um, it's not like fair trade. Mm. With fair trade, I understand exactly what I'm paying and mm. what I'm getting, and we come to an agreement and there's an exchange, we leave happily. So uh, so here I understand that the purpose of forbidding gambling and wine is to avoid disagreement and enmity. Mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said it. Other cases, it doesn't need to be said. So stealing is unlawful. We can any anybody can discern it. We can all discern it, and there's scholarly consensus about the purpose of that. Mm. So the these the illa is uh, it's inferred. It's either stated in a verse or a hadith, or it's mustambat. Right? There's an there's an istimbad process, and ijtihad is based around the um, I- I- inference of appropriate illa. So the illa, they always have to be, they have to have something that the fuqaha, they call a munasaba. Mm-hmm. They have to be appropriate. So the illa for a legal ruling will never be that something is read. It's not like, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's the illa um, can be to prevent harm from coming to somebody else. Mm-hmm. It can be for removing hardship when you're, fa- when you're traveling, yeah. but it's not because something is red or brown. So there's a munasaba that the illa has to comprise. And the fuqaha, when they look at all of the commands and prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they come to an understanding of what illa is munasib and which illa is not. And it's always to do with some kind of a benefit that returns to human beings. Can I ask you about the whole idea of submission? So you said that uh, ibadat is part of this uh, process of submitting to a creator. Yeah. In the rational world in which we live, people will question, why do we need to submit to a creator? That sounds like a very unequal relationship. So the reason why we need to submit to a creator is because the creator exists and he sent us a messenger um, to tell us that he has commanded us to do things and there's a paradise and there's a hellfire. Mm. So in light of that, if that can be shown to be true, and that's the course that you mentioned, why Islam is true, we demonstrate that. If that can be shown to be true, then it's rational to submit to that creator to yeah. avoid the hellfire. Just like if somebody shows you that there's a tornado that's going to strike the neighborhood tomorrow, it's rational to evacuate and go to a safe 
safe place. So, um, so I think that uh, that uh, submission is it, when it's when when it's not based on any kind of reason and it's arbitrary, then it seems unreasonable. But if there's if there's evidence, it's it's reasonable. Now, over and above that, mm. over and above that, the submission. When I come to this realization that God exists and He's commanded me to do certain things. And then I see that he he's telling me to do things that are actually for my own benefit. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have commanded me to do anything. Um, when I look at a verse in the Quran, for example, Inna Allaha ya'muru bil adli wal ihsani wa ita'i dhil qurba wa yanha anil fahsha'i wal munkari wal baghi. We hear it every Friday, yes. right? So it's so this verse, when you read it, there's two ways to read this verse. One, one way is, Inna Allaha ya'muru. Verily, Allah commands you to do X, Y, Z, submit, right? But then if you look at what He's commanding you to do, what is He commanding you to do? Inna Allaha ya'muru bil adli. He commands you to justice. He, ya'muru bil ihsan. He commands you to be kind and generous to other people. He commands you to be kind to your relatives. He commands you to do all of these things. Yeah. When you put in the fact that verily Allah is commanding you to do good things that are for your benefit and for your and for society's benefit, yeah. then this verse, the balagha of it, it it reads as though, oh, what a wonderful thing. Mm. You know, what a wonderful thing. And he's commanding me to do all of these things that bring me benefit. They bring other people benefit. So, uh, so that's the that's the second level. So there's a first level of submission, which is just the realization that there is hell and there's 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 paradise, mm. and that's also a benefit. And so in our rational analyses of whether or not we should submit to God, um, the afterlife has to come into the picture. Mm. When we're speaking to somebody who doesn't believe in the afterlife, we're we're not we're not it's we're not we're not on the same playing field, right? So we have to bring them into our playing field. And then we can have a discussion where we can both understand each other. So the idea of submission is, I mean, you've very uh, well explained it there. It's a very um, evocative picture you paint of, you know, how a human, be human being works and operates on a, on a real level. They want to observe, you know, the, the goodness that something, a, a form of submission brings to them. But can I ask you uh, about the idea of submission in itself, um, how does that help the human being as a, as a, as a, um, I, I'm thinking more about the fitra of a human being, the innate human nature. When we're asked to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how does that help us recognize our place in the universe? So submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think it's, I would rather frame it in terms of worship. Because I think that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to worship him. Yes. Now, worship is um, its submission. It, there's, there's slavehood. But worship is also gratitude to somebody who's done you a favor. Worship is also love for somebody yeah. who's shown you kindness. And, uh, and, you sub and when you submit to somebody who's like that, it brings you a happiness mm. that you can't find anywhere else. And the human being, it, then that's part of our fitrah. Mm. And this is what it means for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create us so that we could worship him. It's not because he needs our worship, but it's just we've been fashioned in such a way that this is what we find happiness in. And without this, life seems pointless, it seems purposeless and you know, bad things happen and, you know, it's last life is bad things happen and life is nasty, short and brutish. <laughs> but from this perspective, I see that my life is full of many good things that are all coming from God. Yeah. And there's a bad thing and there's an afterlife. And if I'm patient, then I will, it, there's good to come. And when we watch many of these videos from Gaza, subhanAllah, it's like a, this is what they're doing. On the issue of um, submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our fitra, um, you talked about um, how the outcome of, uh, of that process is a feeling of happiness and tranquility. Now, I think most Muslims that we come across say very similar things, that when we are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we feel at, 
at one with ourselves and at one with our creator. And there is this this feeling of tranquility, as you quite rightly describe. But then you do come across, especially here in the West, uh, some Muslims who say it's a chore. It's a chore to pray. It's a chore to fast. It's a chore to go on Hajj. And, and these things are very difficult. And if only we didn't have such onerous uh, rules upon us, life would be easier. So they're not really getting that level of, of Sakina that you describe uh, that all, all people should have. How do we address that portion of the community who aren't responding at, to the Islamic Sharia as you, you intend, or as Allah intends? So um, I think that there are there's two aspects. So what needs to happen initially is that there needs to be a recognition that there is an afterlife and that the ultimate benefit of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seen in an akhirah. Mm. So that means that I will have to go through unpleasant things in this life in order to achieve uh, eternal salvation. Um, so uh, when if I don't find my happiness, since that's not the illa of this action, I submit to God and I expect for this act of submission reward in the afterlife. And so the Prophet wasallam he said, من صام رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا غفرت له ما تقدم من ذمه. So he said, whoever fasts the month of Ramadan out of iman, iman is accepting the command of God and submitting to the command of God. احتسابا means expecting to be rewarded. So whoever does this, all of his previous sins will be forgiven. So here it's not a condition for the attainment of this forgiveness that we savor the act of fasting, but we go through it maybe a difficult experience, and but we anticipate something. We anticipate goodness at the end of it. At the end of it all. So the first thing that every Muslim needs to do is put the akhirah in front of them and aim for the akhirah. Mm-hmm. Then over time, as we do that repeatedly, then it becomes easier and easier to do. And this is when we hear of these stories like Urwa ibn Zubair, who his leg needed to be amputated. And so he said, um, you know, no, he said, wait for me to pray. I say, Allahu Akbar, and then amputate my leg. And he was so engrossed in his prayer that he didn't, um, it, he didn't feel the pain or the pain was reduced by virtue of the fact that he was praying. Mm. And that's something that's very beautiful. We all strive towards it. It's important to know and appreciate it. Sometimes we experience it once, you know, and we savor it and we we search for it again. Mm -hmm. I think everybody has experienced something beautiful when they make sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the month of Ramadan, our hearts often, you know, there's there's some, we experience something when we recite the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us a little bit and then there's some difficulties and we keep on striving for that happiness and tranquility that we see in this life Mm -hmm. so that it becomes longer and more constant, but always with the akhirah in mind. What about the hadith which states that the, uh, the dunya is like a, a prison for, uh, for a jailhouse for, for the Muslims and, and, you know, the Jannah is like, uh, and, and, and for the non-Muslims it's like a Jannah. So this, this sort of idea that uh, Islam is restricted, at least there's a limiting aspect of Islam and we are we are confined by these rules. I mean, how do we interpret that hadith? So Ibn Hajar was asked, he was writing, uh, he was one of the greatest hadith scholars and yeah. very finely dressed mm-hmm. on a horse and he was uh, riding it and a non-Muslim came and he was very poor. And so he said to him, he said exactly what you said, that you know, you think like, that the dunya is a, is a prison for the believer and a paradise for the for the non-believer it doesn't look like it like it looks <laughs> like i'm in the prison yes. <laughs> and you're in the jannah and he said that with respect to what is what i what i am going to see in the akhirah the thing that i'm in is a prison and with respect to what you will see in the akhirah the thing that you're in is a is a jannah so it's uh, it's relative. So the hadith isn't saying that if you become Muslim, then the world has to become a miserable place. You're mm-hmm. you're in a prison. It it means that um, it means that the real um, 
happiness that the believer will find will come in the akhirah. Mm -hmm. And since for the disbeliever, he doesn't have anything to hope for in the akhirah, then all of his pleasures are found in this world. Do you think there is a, a difference between how we practice our deen in the West or the quality of how we practice our deen in the West often to that of those maybe in the Muslim world? And I, this is a big generalization, but often in the Muslim world, think about Gaza, you know, it's is, is a cl great example of this. There is just obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this acceptance of his decree. Uh, the, you know, it's immediate. You see it in the faces of the father who's lost his entire family or yeah. the mother who's lost everyone. And there is the, there is a almost a, a certainty to their practice. Whereas in, in the West, we have these hang-ups that we question everything and we have doubts about everything. And every so often you'll get someone who comes to us and says, you know, I'm not sure about this. Why do I have to do this? And this doesn't accord with my my thinking process. Is there a, you know, a difference in the quality of our Islam. And again, this is a very, a very big generalization. And if there is, why? What? What? You know, you've done. You, you, you speak to many people who have doubts about Islam. What uh, reasons do you place as to why we have such a, a weakness of iman here in the West? When we go into sujood and we feel close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Our closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it comes as a result of our feeling of complete dependence upon Him. Mm. And that feeling of complete dependence upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we go through difficulties, then human beings are faced with choices. And uh, when, uh, when in, a, in a difficulty of having you know, a tragic loss, when somebody accepts the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they accept their helplessness and their weakness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's the strength of their iman. The challenge is that when we in the West or in, even in the Muslim world, when we're doing well, then we don't feel that sense of helplessness and weakness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We feel self-sufficient. We feel that we can take care of ourselves. And it's that feeling of self-sufficiency that's our distancing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do we do, right? What do we do? Um, the... One of the ways to overcome this is through um, rational argument. So you can actually, you can reflect. You can reflect on the fact that everything in the universe, it needs something to make it the way that it is. So the sun needs something to make it shine. The wind needs something to make it blow. Um, and, and we search for explanations. So materialists, when they try to explain these things, they ascribe these effects to natural causes. But if you reflect for a moment and you see that the thing that they are pointing to is itself something that's dependent, everything in the universe needs to be explained, then nothing in the universe can really explain what's happening. And the universe needs something independent on which everything is depending. It's a very quick kind of explanation. It's in the Quran, yeah. um, the argument. Um, and so what what I do is I, I work with young Muslims, with, with scholars, with imams, and I help them see this argument and explain it to other people. And this is a rational way in which we can see that really, even now, when I'm sitting here um, in, uh, you know, opposite the Bank of England, in a wonderful, um, beautiful, prosperous city, I'm completely dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this rational realization it then needs to be accompanied with gratitude. So when we are in difficulty, then our obligation is patience and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we are in ease, our obligation is gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that gratitude gives us that sense of neediness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that that other person has when they're going through difficult circumstances. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran, He says, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ he swears an oath and he says that if you're grateful, I will increase you. So, uh, so that's a, it's, uh, it, it's nice to know because, um, you know, we can be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can feel um, our neediness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that will um, increase our blessings, keep us from going through difficult circumstances. But when we forget, um, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes brings us back through, through difficulties. And when we experience those difficulties, then we take as our models, 
um, these people who we see, um, you know, who are you know, far stronger in Iman than we are. Jazakallah khair. And why is it that we seem to have greater hang-ups here than, say, those Muslims in Muslim countries like in Gaza or elsewhere? What, what accounts for that? I suppose what I'm asking actually is, is it because all around us we've got people who question why, why, why? And in a way, is, is thinking leading us to, uh, to question ourselves and question our iman on a, on a daily, on a constant basis? And maybe by, by virtue of being in, in Muslim countries where you're not subject to those sorts of prevalent ideas, uh, people are generally far more confident in their iman. No, so I don't think that thinking is the problem, mm -hmm. right? I think that uh, if we think and we come to the correct realization, the problem then is heedlessness of a reality. The problem is ghafla. The problem is that I am completely dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is an afterlife. And I read about it in the Quran, yeah. but then I forget this reality as I as I enter into the world, as I come out of my prayer and I enter into the world. Mm. Um, and uh, and I think like these struggles, they're actually, they're there in the Muslim world too, right. you know, so um, they're, they're suffering from very similar issues. That's what I've... Um, You've come I've across found. examples of yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I've been trying to understand uh, the sort of the balance between submission and rationality. Now you would argue there isn't really a balance there, you know, submission uh, comes with uh, a level of rationality. One needs to accept Allah and understand Allah before one submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even when one submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no problem in trying to find rational reasons behind uh, the goals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set you or the ahkam sharia that he set to you. So uh, uh, the, the rationality is not at odds with with Islam. But then there is a... There's a uh, uh, I suppose we can call it a modernist trend within uh, the Muslim community. And again, we see this quite pronounced in the West. I see it a lot in America, in North America in particular, who argue that post-enlightenment, you know, uh, we've now gone through a, f a phase where human beings have derived these overarching goals that we can rationally decide, these rights, as Locke would put it. Uh, so human rights, for example, is a is a virtue that we've all, a consensus that human beings have come to. And so what they then say is we need to reinterpret the Islamic text, especially the classical interpretations of Islam, in accordance with this human rights doctrine. Do you see any problem in, in that logic? There's, uh, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. But uh, but before we unpack the problem, I think uh, let's look at the human rights and how it came about in the West. Because I think that helps, it sheds light on this conversation. Yeah. So from the perspective of um, a modern secular mindset, um, religious people are irrational. They're irrational. Why are they irrational? Because um, in the Christian wars of religion, um, Oliver Cromwell, you know, for example, he, um, he murdered... Um, Irish Catholics, he called them Amalekites, you know, mm -hmm. very similar to what we read in the news right now yeah. as in, 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 uh, in Israel. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he used the Bible to justify immoral acts. And so he was, so what the, the, the modern secular world observed was that you have religious people, they read things in ancient texts that are clearly immoral. Mm -hmm. And they then proceed to um, cause harm and death and destruction to other people. And they turn away from their moral sense. They're being irrational. Mm. And, uh, and so this is where an idea of universal human rights would come from. You would say that, well, even if they belong to a different sect of Christianity, even if they're not Christian at all, you know, even if they're Muslim, you know, many of the... Um, Enlightenment thinkers, they, they, they referenced Muslims, you know, as, as so uh, there's a universal human right to um, be safe in your home and not have it destroyed. There's a human, universal human right not to be walk on the street and be killed. So um, this idea of human rights, it arose in the Christian West in response to irrational religion 
in all respects, you know, morally irrational, completely based on you know arbitrary faith commitments. So this is their concern. Now, when we look at it from a Muslim perspective, um, we're not the same. We're not the same for two reasons. First, we can actually reflect and find evidence for the existence of God, you know, evidence that the Prophet is genuinely God's messenger. But secondly, um, the even you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a verse in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la ya'muru bil fahsha. Um, so the scholars of Tafsir, when they interpret this verse, um, and the scholars of Usul as well, they explain that the basic, um, basic uh, morality that every human being um, discerns through their fitrah, such as you shouldn't kill somebody else, you shouldn't um, steal somebody else's property, mm. Um, these kinds of things, every single prophet and messenger, he came to confirm these. So the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they conform with our fitrah. So the, uh, these, the verses in the Bible that exhorted, you know, that led to the Christian wars of religion and are causing the conflict in Israel today, these verses, they're corruptions and, they're, they're, and that's a problem. You know, that's a problem and we're against them too. So the problem with the modernists is that they are accepting the fact that traditional Islamic scholarship is like the irrational um, religiosity of the Jews and the Christians. And I think that that needs to be rejected. Mm. So, um, so what that leads you to is that the commands of God, they have a, they have a rationality. I can discern that there's, they're, they're not arbitrary. My moral sense is intended to be activated by the, by, the, by the commands of God. And so at a high level, things like human rights, the right to be safe in your home and not have it destroyed, the right to walk on the street and not be killed, regardless of your religion, is something that we agree with. So I think that the ideals that the modernist or a non-Muslim would be seeking we would claim that they are there at a high level in the Sharia already. Mm. I think so where you were going was, was almost you were, you were suggesting that there is a, a congruence, an o- overlap uh, between um, human rights at a higher level and Islamic law. Like there isn't a, a contradiction there, right? Yeah, so I think that what Muslims should not do, they shouldn't say that don't do human rights and just submit to God. Yeah. So I think that that is unneeded and misleading, right? And that's that's not so. Uh, and I think that that's a common response to modernists that is incorrect. Yeah. Now the th- the thing that modernists so the thing that modernists are searching for, I think that if they understood the Sharia at a deep level, they would find a lot of it there. Yeah. And they would find that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala His command. But there's misunderstandings. There's things that they don't understand, like. You know, and we can we can talk about yeah. Talk so about let's talk about the hudud punishment because, of course, modern sensitivities argue that um, punishments such as amputations or whatever it may be, these uh, very harsh in inverted commas punishments that come in the Sharia, which hudud means, as far as I understand it, that you know they're non-negotiable. We can't really shift and and change these punishments. These punishments are um, are from a bygone era um, and. Uh, human rights in a way supersedes and abrogates uh, Allah's word on, on these matters. How do you negotiate these competing ideas of human rights as universal and the hudud punishments on the other hand? So I think people don't realize that the five objectives of Islamic law, the preservation of religion, life, um, wealth, uh, lineage, and, and the intellect, they actually come from the hudud punishment. Yeah. <laughs> so the way that Muslims classically understood the fact that you shouldn't drink alcohol and there's a had punishment associated with drinking alcohol is that it's really important to preserve the intellect. Because if the intellect is not preserved, then you cannot act responsibly. Mm. So, you know, we have this problem with drunk driving and people, um, it being illegal to drive while you're drunk, but it's, it's a highly problematic law because if you're drunk, you can't be responsible, right? And 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 you're gonna you're gonna drive, and then you're gonna go against the law. So the rational thing to do if you don't want people to do drunk driving is don't drink. That's the rational thing. 
So, um, so what we learn from the Had punishment on uh, on drinking alcohol is that it's really important to preserve the intellect. Mm -hmm. And what we learn from the Had punishment on stealing is that it's really important to preserve people's property. And so the, the preservation of life, this is the, the punishment for, for murder. So uh, when, uh, so for now, so today, for example, what, do, what, does, what do the hudud punishments mean to me as a Muslim living in a non-Muslim land where they're, not in, where they're not, you know, enforced? What they mean to me is I will not kill anyone. I will not steal anybody's property. And because I understand from the had punishments that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has really, 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 really forbidden. So, um, uh, so, but, uh, so the, the purpose, the purpose of the punishment is not the pain or even the punishment. The purpose of the punishment is to achieve a higher good without which society it cannot function. So these five purposes, they're actually agreed upon by in all systems, every single legal system, even a non-Muslim legal system, it has, it strives towards these five objectives to some degree. And our scholars, they, they wrote about this. Um, so, uh, so it's actually, so human rights are, they help achieve those things. So I guess the concern here is that people who aren't guilty will get a very cruel and harsh punishment meted out upon them. Yeah. Or even people who are guilty will get a very harsh punishment meted out upon them. Mm -hmm. But you know the standards of evidence are really high. It's really easy to get away with these things. Historically, they were they were historically they're not they're barely ever implemented. Mm -hmm. And it's not a spy Muslim society is not a spy culture society. Yeah. So um so the uh, they they uh, but they created they created a society where these higher level objectives, including the objectives of human rights, were met to a very high degree. Okay. And um, can I turn to um, um, when we when you talk about the ibadat, it's very clear that the Sharia has got lots of very detailed prescriptions regarding how to fast, how to pray, and you know when we're in Ramadan, we reacquaint ourselves with all of the various dalil and various uh hukums regarding uh what breaks our fast and what doesn't break our fast so there's a lot of detail do we have that level of detail when it comes to things like politics and economics how do we uh follow the rule of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these matters is there is there a an, an analogous level of detail there in politics in like government government leadership there's not there's not that much. There's not that much detail. There's mo it's more based on um, the achievement of higher objectives. The most important of which is the preservation of uh, the religion and safeguarding the interests of the Muslims. Yeah. Um, and so, a leader would make the decisions that lead to um, the achievement of those objectives. Yeah. Economics is a little bit. I think it's. Uh, you know, now modern day economics is based on a riba system yeah. and interest rates. And uh, and so it's it, it, it's come about as a result of that. Um, I'm not sure how much, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what in, you know, how much of that discussion will apply in an Islamic um, in, in an Islamic context. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot more flexibility there. It's a lot more based on uh, on uh, on the achievement of objectives. So every single action that I do has a command of God associated with it. Mm -hmm. So right now, as we're sitting here today having this conversation, there is a command of God associated with it. It's either obligatory, recommended, permissible. Um, inshallah, it's one of these three. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then and then it could be offensive or unlawful. Mm -hmm. um, so we discern these uh, uh, these rulings mm -hmm. in our ibadat through verses in the Quran and Sunnah. Yeah. But there's a there's a space that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the Prophet um, taught us, there's a space, there's an office, there's an office of the Imam. And this office of the Imam, when it's filled by somebody who's knowledgeable, you know, they classically had to be a mujtahid and meets various other criteria, 
then the decisions that that imam will take um, based on a, a an analysis of how to best meet the interests of the Muslims, they then lead to uh, commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It becomes obligatory to obey him or maybe obligatory to disobey him in certain cases. So there's a the way that the rulings of government were, they fit into the sharia. Um, they were thought of in a very different way than the way that the ibadat are thought of. So how does a, a, a Muslim politician, for example, navigate this really difficult world in which we find ourselves? So um, I, again, I appreciate this is probably not your, uh, your um, expertise, but for example, we've got many of the Muslim rulers who have just completely ignored what's happening in Gaza and, and they've, you know, um, uh, and their argument is, uh, at least some would argue, well, they're, they're acting in a, in a way, in a shrewd way they're attempting to negotiate the benefits for their people and thinking about the longer term. Is that an acceptable excuse to give, you know, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, because the Sharia is quiet on some of these, or at least is, has a lot of space for or license for these politicians to act? So I'm not a politician. And so my answer is, uh, so what I would... Uh, so my answer would be um, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So but why? Because it's actually not about the politician. It's all, it's about the Muslims who are also being governed by the politicians. So what needs to happen in situations like this is that it's obligatory for the Muslim countries to help their brothers and sisters. Yeah. Now, the decisions that politicians are making, th they're making political decisions based on the fact that if I make this decision, it's going to bring about this harm for my country and my citizens will not be able to bear with that harm and they're going to remove me from office or there's other it, it's going to create a situation that's worse than what i'm in this is if it's a conscientious po politician um if it's not a conscientious politician then they'll just they'll have other like per personal gain interests in mind so uh but what we need is we need to have muslims as and Ummah, we need to be able to see that our, we, ne we need to have the religiousness to say that we will do this and we don't care about the harm that will come to us because we're helping our brothers and sisters. So I, I wanted to uh, ask you about, back to the subject of rationality and, and uh, Muslims in the West. Now, uh, for a long time, uh, young Muslims will study st STEM subjects here, but uh, increasingly, as you may have noticed, uh, Muslims are studying philosophy and politics and history, and often these subjects do challenge one's mind. And uh, I've noticed that a number of students who go on to study at a degree level philosophy, for example, their understanding of Islam becomes quite weak and diluted, partly because philosophy is uh, has as, as its core this unlimited study of knowledge. And, that, and, and this relativity is attached to it, that no knowledge is necessarily right or wrong. How do we uh, advise young Muslims who are, who are venturing into these subjects here in the West? So I have a paper, it's called um, The Madrasa Curriculum in Context. It's available online. And uh, there is, classically, we had two kinds of sciences. Excuse me. Classically, we had two kinds of sciences. We had the ulum aqliya, which are the rational sciences, sometimes also called the philosophical sciences, yeah. and the ulum naqliya, which are the revelatory sciences. The rational sciences, philosophical sciences, ulum falsafiya, these are sciences where you reach conclusions without using revelation. You just use your mind. Mm. Um, so medicine is a philosophical rational science because when I want to figure out how to cure somebody of a disease, mm. I don't go to revelation, but I do experiments and I come to a conclusion about how best to cure this person of a disease. Yeah. Um, there was historically Muslims, they integrated the philosophical sciences into the traditional seminary education. Um, it, it led to a situation where the, where the philosophical sciences were Islamized and all of the points of theological conflict were resolved. And you had a graduate who was able to um, give a fatwa uh, but can also talk about issues that are solved through the exercise of reason alone. Today, when you go to the university, 
it's actually not just philosophy, but as you said, the STEM subjects, or not even just the STEM subjects, but every single subject that you study in a university, it's a philosophical science because you reach conclusions using the mind alone. You study history, you study psychology, you study any subject. It's you reach your conclusion using the mind alone. When you do that, then in almost every subject, you will find conclusions that are at odds with revelation. Mm. And then, and that puts us into this, uh, into this position of, you know, how do we make sense of it all? So the first step to doing that is to actually, is to understand that actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he encourage us, encourages us to think. There are so many verses in the Quran that tell us, Afala ta'qilun, once you use your mind, there's not a single verse in the Quran that says don't don't use your mind. When the Prophet ﷺ came, it was the ancient Arabians who were censured for following their ancestors and not doing what their mind tells them to do. And they were censured for doing taqlid. Right. So um so there's a there's an aspect of our revelatory sciences that require us to think, that require us to use reason. So Imam al-Ghazali, he said that revelation is a light and the mind is an eye. So with my mind, I think, but when I shine the light of revelation, then it helps me see clearly. It helps me see clearly, mm -hmm. meaning that I can, I can use my mind and I can come to more clear and rational conclusions. So what's important is I think everybody needs to have a religious education. And we need to study the Islamic sciences. We need to study how our scholars thought. And when we do that, and then we enter into the philosophical sciences, which is everything in the modern university, we are, we're equipped to be able to kind of make sense of it all, to resolve everything. And the first place to start is, um, you know, in, in, I'm making a curriculum for high school students. The first place to start is um, Why Islam is True, the course that you mentioned at the beginning. All right, so tell me a bit more about this curriculum that you're developing. Why have you decided to do that? So I'm developing a curriculum for high school students. Mm. In, adults are also... Uh, in in also, Western high schools? In uh, well, What's happened is that traditionally, um, the only institution of education that the Muslims had was the madrasa. Mm. And the madrasa, it integrated everything yeah. with the uh with uh, with the rise of modernity um muslim countries they needed to modernize in order to modernize you need to have a population that knows english math science and so that it can you can have factories you can have engineering you can have research you can do all of these things so there are separate institutions of learning that developed where they study these things they didn't study religious studies and over time these institutions of learning they won out. So Fazlur Rahman in his book uh, on Islam and modernity, he observed that um, he was a modernist. And so he observed that the fact that, uh, that the modern schooling has overshadowed traditional religious education is a, it means that the vision of modernity has won. Mm -hmm. So our challenge today is to take this modern education that all of our children are uh, undergoing and to fit it into a, an, a religious education that engages with all of these um, subjects and helps Muslims um, do these subjects as a believing Muslim who wants to submit to God. So that's the, that's the purpose of the curriculum. And it's, supposed, it's in English. You don't have to go through a madrasa education to do it, but it takes intermediate level concepts in uh, the traditional seminary education and brings them into the English language and then um, uses them to uh, to integrate everything into a holistic Islamic worldview. And finally, uh, your Why Islam is True course. Um, tell me a little bit about the impacts you've had as a result of of uh, rolling that course out. So, alhamdulillah, we've, so I started off for my own kids. So I started teaching my own kids and the kids of a couple of friends. Yeah. Um, I taught the course um, and its goal is to show rationally that God exists and the prophet is the messenger of God and yeah. revelation is true. Yeah. And it has a, um, a very altering effect on the way that we view everything because our religion is no longer an irrational faith. 
um, which is the way that it's framed to be mm-hmm. by the secular world, that it becomes rational. You can engage with atheism, you can engage with science, you can engage with mm-hmm. uh, with challenges. So um, it's a, uh, it's, you know, the thousands of students have taken it. There's a teacher training program. It's been taught in seminaries. It's been taught in Islamic schools. It's been taught in um, prisons and convert care centers. And um, you know, I'm on a mission to take it to the world because I think it's the most important um, thing that Muslim needs, needs to learn today. Uh, Sheikh Hamza Karmali, Jazakallah Khair. Thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome. Inshallah. It's a pleasure being here. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.